Hello, Startup Vision. My name is Mark Bertonesh. I'm an academic. So I've been teaching in many places all over the world and uh, very happy to be with you tonight. Hello, Mark. Thank you so much for being here on Startup Vision TV to share your thoughts about this uh, crisis. So you're a professor of finance and you teach in uh, very prestigious universities or programs like uh, the Triumph Executive MBA, for example, with the uh, New York University Stern, HEC, and the uh, London School of Economics. You teach also at Oxford, at Le Collège des Ingenieurs in Paris, and uh, previously at Harvard. So let's talk about cash. Cash is crucial, and more than ever, now that investments are going down. Can you explain how startups can achieve a good cash balance? We have, been, we have been saying for a long, long time that cash is king, you know, and uh, it has always been true, but uh, I would say that in crisis, cash is uh, super king. And uh, if I was not afraid to offend or to hurt some uh, religious uh, sensibilities of some people, uh, especially on the Holy Friday, I would say that cash is God, because it is cash who will decide if we'll survive or if we will die. So it's really essential uh, in a period of crisis to develop discipline and frugality. What startup I use to do, you know, all this cash burnout rate, all this cash drain, etc. How can we really maximize cash balances? Six quick directions, and I have more time to develop, but to just to give an idea. First, I would say a very opportunistic revenue management. Try to develop alternate uh, non-traditional revenue streams, which can help in difficult situations when your own product and services are not doing well. Secondly, a very drastic cost management. Uh, convert any fixed cost into viable cost, uh, whether it is a third party warehousing, whether it is a, a contract uh, uh, manufacturing, etc. Third, very smart networking capital management. The cash conversion cycle is essential in a company, in a startup, like in any company. And in a, a period of crisis, we have to have rigor in collection, prioritize clients which have a good a track record in payment, timely and accurate uh, uh, invoicing and billing, and um, do a case per case analysis because uh, it is some customers or some suppliers also, you can, for example, help them because they're in a difficult situation, even if it's creating some problem to you. So it's, there is no general rule, but you have to do case by case and do it the best possible way. Fourth direction, a very dramatic capital expenditure revision. Postpone or stop everything which, has no, which is not useful. Then I would say a very extensive review of financial resources available. Check with your lenders, check with your bankers that your uh, line of credits are still available, uh, check that your debt covenants are not going to be uh, not respected and, and do that uh, very well in advance uh, and explore any possible source of financing, any possible help from all these stimulus packages that you have been uh, uh, developing recently, uh, either from local or from national levels. And finally, I would say a revised incentive uh, management system. Revise your KPI, revise your organization structure and your behavior to really uh, put them in accordance with the cash. Make sure that people are in incentivized for cash and not for anything else. So your favorite acronym is ACDP. It's not a rock band. Um, <laughs> it's very, very important today. Can you explain? Yeah, you're, you're, you're right that uh, ACDC is uh, one of my favorite uh, hard rock <laughs> band. But remember, uh, Florence, that they, they wrote a song, if memory is good, which was called High, Highway to Hell. And I exactly. hope the crisis is not going to lead us to uh, this highway to hell. Uh, why ACDP? ACDP, I make it uh, for four things. A, like anticipation. C, like communication. D, like discipline. And P, like prioritization. Anticipation has always been essential in management. I mean, it's something very important, but it is even more important in crisis. We have to be proactive. We have to show some agility. We have to engage in what we call sometimes rolling forecasts with different scenarios. 
And we have to avoid any kind of panic, any kind of uh, disorganization, and any kind of what we find sometimes in some startup of improvisation. And uh, I, I'm not saying that entrepreneurs should uh, transform themselves in a certified public accountants, but they have to put a little bit of discipline and anticipate uh, quite a lot. Second thing, communication. Communicate with all the stakeholders. I think it's essential. Communicate with your customers, suppliers, we were discussing earlier. Uh, communicate with your lenders, your bankers. Uh, communicate with your uh, associate and your shareholders and avoid any conflicting and confusing messages with them. I mean, communication is something very essential. Discipline, of course. Discipline means rigor, means uh, no waste, uh, frugality, efficiency. I mean, waste are always bad in any business, but in periods of crisis, it, it can kill you and it's even more important. Prioritization, uh, we cannot do everything. And in terms of crisis, the resources are limited, they are becoming scarce. So you have to make sure that you have priorities well defined, well established. Again, no improvisation. And we have to stress that and you have to focus on execution. I, I used to say sometimes that uh, we don't really have a plan until we have something that can be truly executed. And of course, priority in cash, as we were saying for your first question. And, and, and for us, if you like so much ACDC, and if you want to keep ACDC instead of my acronym, you can call it ACDC. It will be anticipation, it will be communication, it will be discipline, and it will be cash. So now we have, again, our rock uh, uh, group. Very good, very good. So, Mark, let, let's go into macro analysis. Um, we hear very, very scary figures, you know, about unemployment, about the GDP going down, about the crisis, how long it's going to last. How deep do you anticipate this crisis to be? And do you think the remedies proposed by the different governments will be enough? Wow, that is a huge question. Uh, do I have hours to answer that? <laughs> indeed, indeed, the figures are scary. I mean, the unit today is billions of dollars. Uh, the EU last night just announced a package of more than $500 billion. The United States announced a few days ago $2.3 trillion. At that level, we don't understand because there are too many zeros and we, we don't understand the figures. I mean, just to give a, a measure of that, Lufthansa just mentioned uh, recently, I think a few hours ago, that they were losing a million euro per hour. I think this is giving the, the, the density of the crisis one million euro, 1.1 billion dollars lost every, every hour. The most countries, one month of crisis, they measure it's between 2.5 to 3% of GDP loss. Mm -hmm. So if the crisis is lasting something like uh, two or three months, let's say three months, it would be a, a decrease in GDP of something between seven to 10% for uh, most countries. So th th this is huge. And, and, and the question that you ask, are, uh, are the remedies enough? Um, we don't know. What we can say is that the remedies were necessary and it's a good thing that it happened because they are going to avoid a big wave of bankruptcies. But the crisis, and everybody understands that, is not a financial crisis. It is, it is a, a, a crisis of the real economy. It is a massive supply shock. It is a massive demand shock. And, and, and we, it's the first time that we are facing this type of crisis. And Money will not be enough to solve that. It's necessary, but it might not be enough. How deep, you say, uh, uh, is going to be the crisis? You know, uh, I don't know if it's Woody Allen who says one day forecasting is difficult, especially for the future. But in terms of crisis, it's even more difficult to make forecasts. And one of the reasons is because the big unknown is how long the crisis is going to last. And are we going to have a second wave? Uh, how the consumers are going to react. Uh, are they going to rush to consume when the things is over uh, to offset the frustration of the confinement? Or are they going to change radically their consumer behavior, in particular in terms of leisure, in terms of uh, 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 travel, etc.? So this is the only thing that we are sure, in fact, uh, or that we know, is that the return to normal will take a long time because a share, a big share of final demand has been taken away, in particular in service. I'm not going to go 
five times more uh, in restaurants when the crisis is over, if it's over, because I miss uh, three or four or five weeks of restaurants. So uh, a, a big part of the fin final demand is lost. There will be, whether we like it or not, in my mind, a selection process. Uh, because good companies only will survive. Th th there, is, there is a kind of a rule which says the higher, uh, the better the company, the higher the resilience of the company. And therefore, as uh, Darwin was saying, only the fittest survive. And it is the first time, and this is the question that I'm very, very often asking myself, that in history, that in the trade-off between health and economic situation, our societies have really chosen health, which is probably good because uh, we have to protect every one of us. But if I, you don't remember that, Florence, because you are too young, but I remember it. I was a student in 1968, 1969, where there was this big Hong Kong flu, which uh, uh, led to a million uh, dead, 100,000 in the US, and nobody remember there was no confinement, there was no mask, there was no... So the, the way we treated this thing was, was very different. So we discovered with the way we have been treating this crisis, which I think is the right way because the life of people is important, but the economic, the economic consequences are going to be enormous and uh, uh, the, the, the future is going to be uh, rather difficult for all the economies in the world. So Mark, let's, let's wrap up with some positive thinking. We, we really need it. Um, if we speak about opportunities, what sectors and what trends do you see developing in the near future? Yeah, yes, Florence, we have indeed to be a little, bit, a little bit positive and a little bit optimistic because if not, people are going to be in a very bad mood. Uh, as you say, you use the word opportunity, I think it's very true. I think it's Einstein who was saying in the middle of any crisis lies great opportunities. And I think we have to, because a crisis very often is a catalyst for, uh, uh, which contributes to speed up change. L let me list a few of them, and there are many more, but the first one, I think there will be a revision of globalization. Uh, globalization is going to stay. I mean, we, the, the word is such, the technology is such, but uh, uh, the people and the countries are going to be more sensitive to dependency, in particular in some strategic goods. And therefore, the production process, I guess, is going to move closer to home, if I can say so. The second trend, I think, is uh, development and acceleration of the digitalization of business. Uh, digi digital connectivity uh, is a way to ensure the continuity of business operations. And uh, the crisis is going to save us time because we have to, we have to do it, we are, we are forced to do it. And it's going to save also some resources because we are going to save some consulting money in many companies to do this, uh, 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 this um, digi digitization. The third trend, which is a little bit linked to, the, to the, the second one, is the automation boom is going to happen faster. It had started before the crisis, but it's going to boom. And the reason is that uh, robots uh, have no problem of cross-contamination. The drones have no uh, contamination effect. So um, we are going to see a change in the production process in the delivery towards a more uh, contactless and um, uh, very much uh, automated way of, of doing things. Uh, I think that um, uh, another uh, a change that we see also is that there will be availability of top talents because um, uh, some companies are going to be in trouble, in travel, in hospitality, I mean, many industries which are in bad, bad shape today, and there will be an ability and a possibility for uh, some companies and startup in particular to recruit some peop top people uh, uh, with a, a lot of expertise and a lot of talent. Which sectors are going to really uh, be uh, favored, if I can say so, by the crisis? Uh, this is difficult to say, but let's mention, uh, mention a few. I think healthcare. Healthcare is obviously everything related with pharmaceutical, with the biotech is going to uh, uh, be strong because the warning signal that something is not working well in our uh, uh, health system all over the world has been very, very strong too. Logistics, redesign of supply chain is going to be another uh, big trend. E-commerce, of course, e-commerce is going to uh, huge, have a huge development. Uh, cyber security is going to be another one, which are very, very strong things. Education, we have seen that you have new ways of educating people, we're educating kids and, and, and that. So there, there will be probably business which are going to uh, have a big uh, future. So 
I would say that the future will be tough. We know that. But uh, we have to keep uh, some optimism. And I like the word that you use, Laurent, optimism. And I am optimistic myself by nature. So uh, despite the crisis and all the difficulties that we are going through now, I will, uh, I will make sure, and, and I am quite sure, that we'll have uh, tomorrows, which will be uh, much, much, uh, much better, and that uh, the economy will be able to uh, come back to what it was, or even better than what it was before. In a different way, at least. Okay, thank you so much. Different way. Thank you so much, Mark, for sharing all those thoughts and analysis, and it's very, very interesting. Thank you for your time, really. My pleasure, my pleasure, Paul. Thank you.